part two of living with a clean conscience. Does most discipleship teaching stir people to remember? What is... What does that mean to remember, to be mindful, to be aware, to be conscious of? Does most discipleship structure and practice and theology and training remind people of the very thing that Psalm says God has forgotten and has removed as far as the east is from the west? Psalm 103, Christ has actually forgotten 2 Corinthians 5, he died for our sins. And out of that, the new creation comes by which it says, old things have passed away and all things have become new. Our sins are forgotten. They're drowned at the bottom of the ocean. They're removed as far as the east is from the west. We aren't living a better old life. The old things have passed away and new things have come. And we are resurrected, Romans 6 says, into newness of life. So why is most of our discipleship reminding people continually that they're sinners who sin? Why are we preaching sin awareness, sin consciousness, sin focus, sin management? It's just the same recycling in a new covenant context of the old covenant perpetual system of sacrifices. There always has to be a reminder of the sin. That's what the writer of Hebrews says, that the constancy of those sacrifices is always reminding people, we got a sin problem. It's you. <laughs> right? You're the problem. Your sin is the problem. Therefore, we got to kill another animal. I'll see you tomorrow. And it's always reminding people that the work is never sufficient. They're never going to change. And yet in the new covenant, when there are new dynamics in place, our message isn't about a new creation. It's about an old sin. It's about an old sin nature. It's about your old habits and your old tendencies and we are preemptively trying to warn people away from those things and in the process, reminding you of the very thing that you are supposed to be moving away from. Why do we build altars around the great dangers and sinfulness of sin rather than joining ourselves to the glorious work of Christ till sin is properly forgotten at the altar of the Lamb who was slain? For the sins of the world. The passage we looked at in Hebrews that I just read, for by one, this, this, is, this is the mystery in one verse. For by one sacrifice, he has perfected for all time. Do you feel perfected? No. Do I feel perfected? No. Do your feelings have anything to do with it? No. By one sacrifice, he is perfected for all time. You can right now say, for all time, I am perfect. Right now, you just kicked your dog and cussed on the way here. And you can walk in that door and say, for all time, I'm perfect. Now, there's a disconnect between who we are and what we're still doing. That's real. That's why, with one sacrifice, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. But the life of the believer is the great reversal of every other system of human improvement, if you will. Every other system of, of, of human interaction a, attempting to uh, better themselves, attempting to uh, move into greater degrees of fruitfulness or life or hope, every other system, you are a victim and the slave of your past. And you are constantly trying to break free from your past. In Christianity, you are tethered to who you are in eternity, and that is pulling you forward. 
You are becoming who you are. You are not the slave of who you have once been. And so with one sacrifice, he calls you perfect, and therefore you're being sanctified by the magnetic attraction of who Christ has called you to be, and he, you are becoming who you are from a position of perfection rather than the bondage of your past self. Every other system is trying to figure out how to liberate themselves from the past or reinterpret the past so that it's really not an issue. No, it really is an issue. It's a mess. You were a mess, but now you're perfect and you are becoming sanctified to that perfection. If the body of sin has been brought to nothing, as Romans 6.6 6 and Hebrews 10.17 says, why are we obsessed with the body of sin as the path to holiness? I'm asking some things in an intentionally kind of provocative way, but I ask you to consider that question purely on the merits of your own results. Has your focus on avoiding sin produced holiness? If so, what's your definition of holiness? We already looked at the fact that Jesus, that, that the Lord in creation made the Sabbath holy before there was any reference point to sin. So holiness must not be what we think it is. Thus far, has your obsession with avoiding sin actually produced holiness or simply a frustrated fixation upon the very thing you wish to be rid of? Even should you succeed, and you can't, does the absence of immoral behavior equal holiness? Does works produce holiness? You know, the interesting thing as a requirement in the Old Testament, it, it, was, it was actually Ezekiel and Ezekiel prophesying of the priesthood to come that was a picture of the, the new covenant priesthood and they couldn't wear anything. They couldn't wear wool or linen or anything that made them sweat. They had to wear very light, breathable fabric. I think it describes it as cotton. But they couldn't wear wool because it made them sweat. Why? Because the new covenant priesthood can't labor. You can't give yourself to the kind of work that produces sweat. It's a different priesthood. I'm going to close with this thought. We've talked about the completion of God's work in which he rested and set aside the Sabbath as holy, in which man had his first full day in the finished work of God. We just looked at how Jesus after he offered the sacrifice, he ascended to the right hand of the Father and sat down. It was no more work. It was done. It is finished. It is finished. It is finished. So what is it in, in, in uh, what would be the strategy of the enemy to get us out of that? If it really could be that complete and we don't have to keep bringing the sacrifices over and over again, either in ourselves, what we expect of ourselves, how we think God relates to us. I mean, you can just apply that in so many different ways. If that's not really the question, and there is a place that we could enter into his rest, that's what Hebrews 3 and 4 spends a great deal of time talking about, labor to enter into his rest. The real challenge is to get into rest. That can be hard. But it's not work, yet it's a process to get there. So what could get us out of that? Is there a place that we could be at rest in his rest? And if so, what could get us out of it? You all familiar with C.S. Lewis and the screw tape letters? I think uh, the brilliance of that is this whole idea that there's this senior demon that's instructing the junior demons in all of the ways of temptation and vice to ruin the, the, the lives of, of Christians. And there's some really brilliant stuff in there. 
But in the, in the line of C.S. Lewis and the screw tape letters, I would suggest that Romans 7, 9 is perhaps the most studied verse in hell. If there is one passage that demons give themselves to doctorate level study on, it is Romans 7, 9. Here's what Romans 7, 9 says. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. King James says sin revived. You want to understand how to get out of rest and into a revival of sin? You want to understand how to move out of fellowship with God and union with Christ? The enemy would love to revive the power of sin in your life. By one sacrifice, he's perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. He said it's done. He's at rest. The work is finished. We could live there. But the most studied verse in hell is how to reactivate sin inside you. How to trigger and inspire and make alive again and revive the power of sin. You say, well, that feels so easy. I I struggle with so many things. This is instructing us that if sin is coming alive again in whatever area you're struggling, it's an area where you are attempting to achieve righteousness according to law. And the enemy can leverage that all day long and twice on Sunday to revive sin, to inspire and make alive sin. Sin. 